Let us pray. Lord God, open our hearts and minds by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word is proclaimed, that we may be filled with hope, renewal, and the revival of our souls. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be satisfactory in your sight, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter beginning in the 13th verse. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken to him. There's a story of a preacher that started his sermon with a warning. You better put your feet under the pew in front of you because I might be stepping on some toes. I would imagine that every time Jesus preached the sermon, folks would be putting their feet under the pew in front of them because he surely stepped on a lot of toes. And this morning, when we visit Jesus in the temple, it was no different. For Jesus had a zeal. When he cleansed the temple, when he drove out the money changers and those selling cattle and, and, and sheep and doves, not with anger, but he did with zeal for the love of the people. But you know, the people didn't quite see it that way. They saw it as an intrusion. Like Moses bringing down the Ten Commandments, Listening to the Ten Commandments being spoken this morning reminded me of what God has called us to do. But I would imagine not all 400,000 uh, Hebrews that came out of slavery in Egypt felt the same way. That perhaps those rules that Moses offered were rules of intrusion as much as Jesus intruded upon the traditions of the temple. For when Jesus went to the temple, I'm sure he was seen as some crazy guy trying to change who they were, trying to change their traditions, those things that they have always done year after year after year. And who is he trying to change them? You see, back then, people would travel for for days to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And during the Passover, they would sacrifice their, their animals, but it was too far a ride to bring animals. And so what the temple decided to do was to set up shop out back. And they would sell cattle, and they would sell sheep, and they would sell doves, and they would sell all this other stuff. Imagine the temple rented the tables. I'm not sure about that one. And then there is these people called the money changers, those who exchange coins with, with Caesar's picture on it, the coins without his picture, and a huge profit, gouging the people. It's like going to a ball game and paying four bucks for a 10 cent hot dog, or 25 cents for, for or six dollars for a 25 cent bottle of water. You feel like a sacrificial animal with that. 
Whoever came up with the idea of putting water in a bottle and selling it was an absolute genius. But I digress from what we're... This was not selling roast beef tickets. That's okay, by the way. That's a good thing. It really is. No, this is something different. This was not only the abuse of the system, it was the abuse of the people. And Jesus was concerned about both. He was concerned that, that the system had forgotten, the institution of temple had forgotten why they existed in the first place, and that is to proclaim the Ten Commandments that came down uh, from, from on high through Moses. They had long forgotten why they were church. And I think today we can talk about church. They long ago forgot the reason for being church. For the house of prayer became a shopping mall. The house of prayer became a smorgasbord of everything but worship of God. Everything but giving glory to God. So the tables of the money changers represented to Jesus barriers to people to come closer to God. As I was praying about this scripture, Abby and I were both procrastinating, doing homework one night, and we were watching the, the, the Prince of Egypt and hearing Moses, actually it was Aaron according to scripture, saying, let my people go to the Pharaoh. I could see that happening with Jesus as well. Jesus was telling the money changers and all those uh, folks who are in the leadership capacity of the church, let my people go. Let my people go and worship God in spirit and in truth. Don't put those barriers in front of the people. For the institution of church was so embedded in its own rules and regulations, so embedded in selling animals and exchanging coin, that was no longer open to the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to facilitate real and meaningful growth. All of a sudden, everything was blocked off. Jesus had no concern for tradition, had no concern for those folks setting up the tables in the back room, no concern for the pleas that said, we've always done it like this, and we'll continue to do it like this, you see, Jesus. Didn't care for that stuff at all. He was not concerned about tradition. He was concerned about souls. He was concerned about everlasting life. He was concerned about soothing sin-sick souls. So not only did he upend the tables, he upended the system. The power base and the traditions that kept the the, the temple institution alive was actually killing the people spiritually. So after Jesus cleaned house a little bit, the temple was in chaos. They didn't know what to do. All of a sudden, the folk couldn't always do what they always had done, and they were wondering, what did this crazy guy do to us? Now all we have is God. There is chaos. But saints, the only arena in which change can take, ever take place is in a state of chaos. When everything is upended. Sometimes the only way to save something is to destroy it and begin anew, to begin fresh. 
But that takes incredible love. It takes incredible dedication. It takes zeal. It takes the whole church to be zealous, to be excited for something beyond ourselves. Not for tradition, but for salvation. Being lukewarm and noncommittal, apathetic, are the very tables that Jesus was upending. God doesn't leave us alone in this work. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and self-discipline. So what Jesus did that morning when he went to church, and I'm sure after that, every time he came, now what? But Jesus took authority. The authority to take God's church back. Because sometimes we become complacent. Sometimes we forget who we are and whose we are. Sometimes we forget why we are here in the first place. And Jesus has a way of coming into our lives to remind us a little bit. Why we are here. The things we always do aren't necessarily bad, by the way. Sometimes traditions are good. Because sometimes they lead people closer to God. Those things are good. But sometimes we have to tear down the build up tell you a story about a colleague of mine who had the congregation build a new church. It was a beautiful church. Incredible. Big chancel and amphitheater type. They even had a waterfall in the middle. I thought that was kind of neat, except I was there for worship, and when you hear the water going. But it was really nice. So I asked the pastor, I, I said, now, how did you get this congregation from leaving, actually tearing down the old church and building this new, grand, glorious church? And he said, Tom, it wasn't easy. They were about ready to throw me out. Because all I kept hearing was, that's where our babies were baptized, that's where our loved ones were buried. That's where all the things that were meaningful in our lives happened. That's where our kids were confirmed. That's where we worshipped. That's where we laughed. That's where we cried. And I said, okay. So what turned the tide? He said he asked one question. What is more important, your tradition or your children? And all of a sudden, there is quiet in the meeting. And she, he said that there's a lady in the back who started to cry. And she said, I want this church for my grandkids. And another said, I want this church for my neighbor's grandkids. I want this church to be here even to the end of the age. And I will do whatever it takes. You see, that was Jesus' mentality too. When he walked into the temple, it was the same thing. Jesus said, it's too important to allow these things to go on. It's too important for the money changers to be back there gouging the people and, and they become so poor and, and so downcast they can't bring themselves to God or to pray to God. There's something more important than that.
No, you see, Jesus was not zealous for the building. Jesus was not zealous for the tables. Jesus was not zealous for the pews, for the carpet, for anything. Jesus was zealous for the people. He was excited about the message. Because in the message of God, there is hope. There is revival. There is renewal. And sometimes we find ourselves in a position where we have to look out and say, the world is changing and we are changing. God's word will stay the same. But God's word needs to be heard in the world that we are in today. On our Easter journey through this Lenten period, we need to reflect upon why the church is here in the first place. To get excited about the word, to get excited about our Lord that went to the cross and that was no easy task. But not to water the message down about the cross. There is something that struck me early this morning, and all week long, in fact. When I got up this morning, you see, I was afraid that I was going to miss being in church because of the time change. And I didn't think that would be a good thing for the preacher to do. So I got up awful early, and I started praying. I started praying for all of you, started praying for the church, started praying for the message. Then I suddenly realized something. Do you see something odd about this prayer list? I'll tell you what's odd about this prayer list is the number of people that are on the list. In that right column, the number of people who are grieving the loss of loved ones. And I got to thinking about preaching this morning. And I started thinking why Jesus was so zealous when he upended the tables of the money changers. He was zealous for these folk. He was zealous for us. That need hope in the midst of a hopeless world, who need affirmation in the time of loss, who need the presence of God in their lives as they grieve the loss of one they hold dear. You see, that's why Jesus was zealous. He didn't facilitate change for the sake of change. He knew that we need this word. And he knew that we need to come unencumbered to the word, to the foot of the cross, to lay our burdens at his feet that we may live. You see, that's what it's all about. It's not about money changers. It's not about... Uh, selling stuff in the back. It's not about tables. It's all about the folks, you and I, and all of these we prayed for this day and throughout the week that need Jesus in their life, that need hope and renewal in their life. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. There's no other reason. Saints, it's time to be zealous. It's time to proclaim the good news. It's time to take the tables of, of apathy and uncertainty and hatred and misunderstanding and upend them so that we may live. It's time to be zealous. Time to take away those things, everything, 
that hinders us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what Lent is all about. To clean us up a little bit. So we can see more clearly where we're going. I'm going to steal this from St. Paul, and I'm sure St. Paul won't mind. Saints, we need to be convinced. Absolutely convinced. That neither death, nor life, nor powers, nor highs, nor lows, nor things above, nor things below, We need to be convinced that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Nothing will separate us from the love that transcends everything. Nothing will separate us from the love that we hold dearly. Not tables, the money changers, not cattle, not nothing in the world. And so as we leave this place today, let us consider those things that hinder us from this journey. Cast them away. Up and them. So we may be convinced that nothing will separate us from the love that God shared with us through Jesus Christ. As he hung on that cross, as he vacated that grave, that we may live. Amen.